Hey there, MC here. So what's the point of computer interaction? I guess we can answer that a bunch of ways. But one of them that we might think about in terms of the ideas coming up in looking at cognition and interaction is that devices are used for particular purposes. And that's generally referred to, or has been um, increasingly referred to, as to support external cognition. And that's, wow, cool. External cognition, you can see that right over here. Um, external cognition is used to uh, think about cognition as a way of saying, okay, look, I don't want to hold this in my head. I can't trust myself to hold this in my head, so I'm going to make a note or um, take a picture so that I can return to this idea without having to try to shove it all into long-term memory. And if you don't know what working memory versus long-term memory is, that's definitely worth taking a look at. So if we have this notion of externalized cognition, we can see an awful lot of software is done to help us work with ideas, or generally speaking, what in, um, uh, we can say is KR as a way to remember this is knowledge representation is computers help us with knowledge representation and we can think about that whether we're using a spreadsheet and then turning it into a graphic to help us process and make sense of something uh, that's what's going on and in fact most of the chapter discussion in chapter three looking at actual models of cognition around how do we build knowledge in the brain is all about how does stuff get into the brain and what are the various processes that are available to us that all relate back down here to this sense of knowledge recognition. So you can go through a, a ton of these and we'll see things anywhere from attention to reading to problem solving, language learning, uh, lower level can be memory, executing a task, so finding it out of your brain where it was and being able to deliver it. Um, when we look at people who have had uh, brain injuries and now they have difficulty seeing on the right side uh, of their bodies. Their eyes are working, but they're not processing information from the right side, or their language is being disrupted, that they know what they're looking at, but they can't find the word for it. All this is around the cool stuff that goes on inside of the brain. Uh, so what, what's the computer doing? Well, it seems that in terms of our focus on computer interaction is that we're looking at how, does, how do we design tools to help us mediate between um, the brain and what we're trying to do. So some of these in terms of, of our interests, what might be uh, tracking going for a run to taking notes in class. And so a lot of this seems to be about how we can support knowledge representation by making sure that our designs can leverage all these more particular processes about how the brain actually starts to encode information. And so some of the concepts within that that are really key are notions that we have here that we leverage in design around conceptual models that we talked about last week and notion of mental models. How do we understand a process and what's the difference between a mental model and a conceptual model? And how can these be expressed sometimes in terms of things like interface metaphors? And I've put some pictures down here of classic interface metaphors from the earliest days of visual computing as opposed to command line computing and some interesting apps that take again as their metaphor like this task timer of a pomodoro the the kitchen timer that looks like a tomato and that an app has been designed to replicate those features um, but it's using the metaphor of a kitchen timer to constrain what we talked about before of a conceptual model that is uh, a kitchen timer makes a task happen within a particular set of time. It has to take that particular set of time, like you're baking a cake, and so uh, you want that to know when that uh, time is up, but also make sure that you have that time to do that task. And so the idea has become, oh, okay, let's offload that counter. Uh, instead of it just being a timer, it's also keeping track of this thing that you supposedly value, which is what are you doing with this 25 minute segment of time. So it's using one metaphor in a tool to do some knowledge representation and also offloading because it lets you say, oh, I don't have to remember how many of these I used. I can just do it and watch my progress and boy, am I getting to be way more organized. So that's one example of an interface metaphor. And we can say, well, what part of cognition is this taking care of? Well, we have this, uh, this is a good exercise, but just to, to kick it off, we have right here 
the Pomodoro itself connects over to what we recall in our memory about what does this thing mean? Uh, what have our experiences been on? So we can draw on that plus perhaps some new uh, learning that we might have about how this device actually works. Pretty easy to play with. We can figure it out a little bit. And then we can start using it in the context of, oh, how long does a particular task like watching this video clip or preparing for class actually take? Is that a half a Pomodoro, a full Pomodoro? And from that, we can start to build knowledge, in this case, not about how to use the device, but about ourself. And by repeating using that, which is how learning takes place to convey ideas and to encode ideas, we start to get better at these processes. So the device helps us do some of this memory building, encoding, uh, and building skills, um, and also potentially enabling us to improve other processes like attention and reading that are also happening in terms of our cognition. Also within this, we might ask, uh, so we've got this really big concept here, really, um, it seems quite simple to say, oh, an interface type, we've got some metaphors happening, but this touches on a lot of help with being able to go towards what we talked about in one of the first lectures around intuitive design, that intuitive design actually is just playing on these patterns of things that have become familiar to us, and they're familiar to us in the way they let us remember things and encode things uh, in these ways, these important types of cognitive processes like perceiving and thinking to making decisions. So that's part of how we can think about testing our designs. Which of these cognitive processes does the interaction itself rely on to enable it to do its work as effectively as possible? And how is it helping to build various cognitive processes over here? Another thing to take a look at here in terms of, of metaphor is uh, this one here, Remember the Milk, actually uses kind of a metaphor uh, and an analogy. The metaphor that it uses is a paper-based to-do list, because that's what it's talking about, is just like, I want to remember to do these things, like picking up the milk. And it uses this notion of remember the milk, which is actually a conceptual model over here about a particular state of tasks, so that this is triggered for the person to say, I recognize the situation. So if you've never made to-do lists, or not that familiar with it, that's kind of an abstract notion. These guys have made uh, the concept of the to-do list a lot more concrete by saying, ah, but you've probably had the experience where somebody has told you or you've tried to tell yourself, I have to remember to do this task over here, and you've forgotten. And this is to help you not forget or fail at that task. Some of these other ones that you might want to take a look at is the um, metaphor of the uh, personal assistant that Apple used for its knowledge navigator and the desktop is perhaps the most famous one and this one over here of the flower is uh, not about a metaphor at all but it is about again how we can start to use concepts for cognition to ask how are we building our interfaces so in this case right here we have uh, the red flower on the green grass background. It'd be very easy for me to say how many red flowers there are. Uh, it might not be that easy to say, well, how many green grass uh, bits are there in this picture? Uh, so that might take a bit of time to actually count them to get an accurate number, but the, the red pops out and it's very easy to say, there's one there. We, we're good at counting to two and this let us count to one very, very well. Um, so it's very much within our cognitive capacity to do some recognition of something in front of us so that we can begin to uh, encode that pattern against things that we know and answer questions about it without having to offload that. It gets back into being able to recognize things. So how can we design our interfaces to build up these kind of patterns so that they're recognizable? So what we've touched on, and I will leave this graphic for you, um, on probably the wiki is that interaction design is deeply connected to notions of cognition or that is knowledge building and knowledge representation how the brain brings information into it and we've looked at the idea that the brain has a bunch of ways of bringing in information to it to process it against uh, perception learning language memory and so on how we build attention problem solving and Within that, 
that we use interactive devices that are built with um, metaphors of the interface, mental models, are, uh, that give us mental models of how the system works so that we can understand what uh, this tool is actually for, whether it's something as complicated as a word processor versus a timer app uh, to support a particular kind of work uh, task orientation in a particular constrained problem space, or is it to help us do problem solving and how do we check whether this is just an externalized cognition thing for doing some offloading like our list over here, or is it distributed cognition more like where we're trying to think about um, how we can work together and become more efficient at managing a task. You might want to check for examples uh, in the gaming world that rely on distributed ga um, cognition for multiplayer games. How does that work? How do you design for that? And also this notion of thinking about what's an example of a game design or, or a work design that uh, uses embodied cognition rather than, say, just externalized or distributed cognition. And so by asking those kinds of questions against your interface, you can begin to assess that interface for its efficacy, uh, how well it will do what it does, and how that interface is actually drawing deliberately on the various strengths of our cognitive processes. Fantastic. Okay, talk to you soon.